The reader has been completed. We're going to be going over a couple of topics. I have PowerPoint presentations. We already had one on ethics and leadership in the area of the railroads and the ethical aspects of that. So what the first one was rail roads abbreviated RR. Okay, the second one that we're going to be dealing with, my favorite topic, mining. What kind of mining do we have at the moment in Lebanon? Engineers. Which, which part of engineering deals with mining? Civil engineers? Civil. Okay. Civil engineers. What kind of mining do we have in Lebanon at the moment? At the moment. What kind of mining? Quarries. Rock and sand. Rock and sand mining. A very, very simple form of, of mining, if you will. Uh, so. We'll be dealing with the mining as it is today to describe the culture of impunity. So it's mining and impunity. Then there's going to be one on the role of religion and social justice. A lot of you when you answered the question on the, third, the second test, which I have to give back today, you didn't quite understand what the concept of social justice is. We, we dealt with the principles enshrined in the papal encyclicals. Encyclicals, what are they? Can someone tell me briefly what an encyclical is? Yeah, they're papal encyclicals, so they're uh, issued by the Pope. Anything else you can tell me? Okay, they're authoritative, and if they are of a theological nature, they are infallible, which does not mean they're not wrong. It means they cannot be questioned. They cannot be contested. Infallible does not mean it's it can't be incorrect. It means it can't be questioned as long as the Pope doesn't question it himself if it's a theological text. If it's a non-theological text, or if the parts of the encyclical are not dealing with theology, then the uh, infallibility does not apply. So, railroads and mining are very similar in, in the ethics area. I mean, there's ecological issues, and there's issues of government corruption and industrial corruption. Religion and social justice, here the papal encyclical that we referred to originally was which one? It's also in Hill, in Linda Hill. The first rerum novarum. Correct. And finally, I forgot it myself. Yes, okay. CSR, now how could I forget that? A CSR example from the food processing sector. The food processing, what you probably notice is I'm dealing with topics that I like. Uh, uh, what? I'm dealing with topics that I like. Yeah, I could ask you, and then you could, we could choose topics that you like, too, but I'm the teacher, right? So, railroads, you all know that I'm in love with railroads. Mining is a big topic. Guys, everybody in this class could have a future that's somehow related to the mining industry, oil and gas. Then, religion and social justice, very important. We notice now that, what happened, what happened yesterday in, in the Vatican? For the first time in human history, we had Jewish, Christian, and Muslim prayers simultaneously in the Vatican. And I'm not aware about the Jewish issue, but this is the first time that Muslim clerics have prayed publicly in the Vatican. This is a huge step. You might not be aware of it, but what the Pope is doing is, 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 is breaking, is, confronting a lot of taboos, a lot of things that people said, well, you can't do that. Now, when the Pope invites rabbis and Muslim sheikhs, Jewish rabbis and Muslim sheikhs, to pray publicly, is that a sign of strength or weakness? Why? 
Okay, one issue is he's, he's uniting the, the religions and he's not feeling... So he has no regret. Okay, that's good. He, feels, he's, he stands by his decision. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't feel threatened. You can do this kind of thing when you don't see it as a threat. So it's a, it's a sign that the, the, the Pope feels very strong, strong enough in his position to invite the other two Abrahamic religions, and especially Islam, and we know that there is a historical conflict around the world between Christianity and Islam, not so much Judaism. Okay, finally CSR will be dealing with the food processing industry and also with a very interesting example of uh, food processing in what we often call the third world. So, uh, did you all get your pop quizzes back from last week? Okay, good. So at the end of this class, we'll be dealing with the tests, and, and we'll, we'll do that, of course, off camera. Okay, good. So this is the, the last class. I'm going to be testing this, and you probably saw the Facebook group that I put on the wall. By the way, all of these PowerPoints are now on Blackboard. I'm not going to put them on Facebook. It takes too long. But they're all four on Blackboard, which means they will be on the test. Yes, okay. Now, there's a new Facebook group called O E R F L P S G I R. So, <laughs> a new group. Bravo. You you I'm not going to invite you. You have to you have to ask to join yourself. It's a it's a private group, so you can find it and it's already put on been put on the ethics and leadership. OER is obvious. What? No. These are we call it acronyms. Acronyms are, are words that are made up of the first letters of other words, right? So FLIP stands for the Faculty of Law, Political Science. And GIR stands for the Department of Government and International Relations. So each faculty, including your faculties, sooner or later, will be having their own OER groups. Yes, which question? Yeah, well, well, you will, you will. But for those of you who are in this class who want to start working on the student group, I brought this up at yesterday's OER. Every Monday at 12 we have a, an OER meeting for the university. I brought this up and the OER ad hoc group, working group is very, very supportive of creating a student group. So what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create the student group here in the Facebook group that is already existing for our faculty. It doesn't really matter whether it's engineering or political science or architecture or graphic design or whatever. It's basically the same concept. So if you're interested, and some of you said you were, in joining this Facebook group. Okay, these are the, these are the PowerPoints. So, if somebody can start, uh, help me s set up the uh, PowerPoint presentation, we're going to move on with the next PowerPoint presentation. Who's, who's my techie? Okay. There's no, there's, there's no extra credit for being the tech guy, okay, or girl for that matter. Tech guy or girl, okay. So, what, what, what are we doing here? We're taking examples now from the real world and we're trying to find the ethics and leadership components. So you can do this in any sector, any sector that is, in, that is significant politically, culturally, socially, economically obviously, militarily, will have leadership components in it because it's about power and about affluence, resources. So having control of them is one of the aspects of leadership. I get to decide what we do with the money. I get to decide what we do with the weapons. I get to decide what we do with the police or the access to the media, whatever. These are typical eth uh, leadership. Leadership is, do you need a, oh, okay. That's how you have to do it? <laughs> okay. These are engineers, yes. I'm so glad. I hope, I, ho I hope I'll have this course in the fall and I hope I have a lot of engineers in the fall too. By the way, although it says in the pre-registration that I'll be teaching this course in the summer, I won't. I don't teach in the summer. Because I like to have off for three months. You know how nice that is? You know how nice that is? 
It's, I, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. Just tell your friends it's a mistake. It's the pre-registration. It's not the registration. So I, it's full. It's, it's full. I know it's full, but I'm sorry I got about that, guys. Okay, good. So please put up now the mining. When we're, when we're dealing with, oh, I would say take out the middle one and put the two side ones. Put the two side ones. Yeah. That's good. I think that's good, okay? No, that's not good. It's, it's not, can you see me? Yes. No. No, that's, this is what we want. That, exactly, this is what we want. Okay. Good. Okay. This is had I last time. Yeah, okay, good. And what I do is just push, yeah. Okay. When we look at the, guys, when we look at the leadership issues related to ethics in the oil and gas industry, can we have some quiet in the back, please? Guys, come on, it's the last, the last class with the camera. Bear with me. So, when you look at the mining industry that's upcoming, the mining industry that we're about to experience in the next several decades is going to be unlike anything you've experienced. I mean, your, your, your lives are not that long, but you or your parents have experienced in this region, for, at least with respect to Lebanon or the Mediterranean coast. It's going to have an incredible impact on not only the economy, but the political system. If we look at the system as it is, is today, it's a culture of impunity, which means when crimes are committed in the mining sector, they are rarely punished. Sometimes they're not even punishable. Sometimes there's not even the instruments in place to enforce the rules. So let's have a look at the current existing mining industry. That didn't work. Okay. Why isn't this working? Right? Yeah, I'm pushing it. I'm pushing it. Okay, engineer. Click with the mouse. No, I don't want to do that. Okay. I'm pushing this here. Okay, now it's working. Okay, good. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, good. So, as I said, this is already up and running. A little bit about my background. When you're doing research, especially when you're doing research in controversial areas, I, my background in mining is in the province of South Tyrol, or Sud Tyrol, and I did a social history, as it says here, uh, on the mining in the Italian Alps. This is high altitude mining, for those of you who are interested in uh, technologies dealing with mountainous regions. These are mountains that start at around 1,500 and go up to 3,000 meters. Imagine doing heavy industrial production, in this case mining, in those conditions. And there's a saying in English, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If someone has a pudding and they say, this is a wonderful pudding, why don't you try it? Uh, you'll say, well, you know, or wh why don't you buy it? You say, well, first I'm going to try it. I want to see if it's any good. So the issue here is that the, the laws in mining in Lebanon are often not enforced, they're not implemented. So let's have a look at, this is, this is an issue throughout the world. So it's going their own direction. Yeah. D yes. Pudding, pudding is a, uh, how would you describe pudding, OK? <laughs> it's a dessert. You, you know it, creme caramel, for example, is a pudding. It's a type of pudding, right? OK. Good. This is the book I did uh, on high-altitude mining. This, these mines were the mine is pictured here, 2,000 meters, and there were 3,000 people living there year-round, including the families. So another issue of context. It's always interesting to put things in their historical context. Where did this come from? The science department, this is back in 2006, in March of 2006, uh, did a, an event on science and society, and I did a lecture on, there you go, the proof of the pudding, 
is in the eating, the non-implementation environmental policies in the mining sector. We can assume that this non-implementation, this ignoring of the law that exists now in the mining sector will continue with oil and gas. So we're probably in big trouble. And who is Jordan Who is what? Jordan yeah, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? I don't have no idea. So, there's been a lot of articles about the illegal mining in Lebanon. 80% of the mines, it's estimated, in Lebanon are not certified. I'm not going to go into the details here. The trajectory of this afternoon's presentation. Let's start with the historical roots of modern in mining industry, because mining has a history. And the mining laws that we have in Lebanon are built on the French laws, which are built on the Latin laws the, from the Roman Empire. I'm going to move from a theoretical introduction to show how in Lebanon laws are passed, good laws are passed, and then ignored. And we can assume this is going to be the case uh, as well with oil and gas. What is policy analysis? What is policy? Can anybody tell me? No. Policy. Does anybody, political science students, don't we have one political science student? <laughs> Policies are comprehensive, which are, means complex, they cover a lot of territory. Comprehensive sets of rules which are set up to change things. For example, if you have a policy on education, it's supposed to determine how the schools are run throughout the country. If you have a policy on defense, then it would determine what kind of weaponry, where are you going to buy it from, who's Lebanon allied with. If we have a policy on health and safety at NDU, one of the core issues, of course, would be smoking. And we all know that the smoking policy, although it exists and has a lot of different stipulations, is not being enforced at all. Once in a while they try something, but normally it's not. So, policy analysis. Just my, way, my background, I did a, a study of the US occupation after World War II in Austria, and that's my background. And policies, normally they, there's three steps. The first is we, we talk about an issue, we have a problem. For example, we're going to have oil and gas, we need a policy. We need an overarching, we need a governing set of rules. Clear. So that's putting something on the agenda. I'm not, I can't write anything here. An agenda, you all know what that word means. Agenda? Schedule. It's the schedule of things that are to be done. Right. So you put it on the agenda. Then there's decision making. Normally, if it's a governmental policy, it's in parliament where it's voted on. It's then it's ratified by the Council of Ministers. The decision is made. Third step. What's the third step? No, that's the second step. The third step, first you talk about it, you discuss it, you draft it, then you discuss it, implementation. And it's the third step, the implementation, the implementation step, which is the big problem in our region. Laws are, things are discussed, laws are often very good, they're passed based on the previously French model, today more it's the more Anglo-American model, so the laws are usually pretty good, they're not implemented. So, so the second issue in my background is mining in the, in the Italian Alps. This is, I showed you the book. And one of the things that you notice is that the mining industry is very, very exact. Why would the mining industry have to be very rigorous and exact? In its implementation of rules. If you're not exact, it's sort of like the trains. If you're not very, very careful about applying all the rules, making sure that everybody obeys them, two things very bad happen. One, you have lots of accidents, and a lot of people die, and the second is you lose lots of money. Both are things that most people don't like to do. Die of an accident and lose money. So, as a rule, railroads and mines are very similar. Their technologies should be close to the heart of every engineer, they're technologies which require a lot of your time. And basically, if you want to be good at mining or railroads, you have to love it. Because it's not going to let you sleep. So, 
So if you love it, then you don't mind. Okay. Finally, what is the role of academics, of scientists, in what I call here the developing world? The developing world are the countries that used to be colonies, as opposed to the countries that used to have colonies. So Africa, Asia, Latin America, the developing world as a rule, and Europe and North America, the developed world. Can we really introduce Western concepts of policy studies one-to-one -one in the Middle East? Can we actually assume that the rules, and we've been talking about this all semester, can we assume that the rules that are common in Europe and North America, Australia, Japan, can they be enforced here one-to-one? -one? Can they be introduced? I hear a lot of no's, right. They can be, <laughs> good one, okay, they can be introduced, they just won't be implemented, so the answer is no. So, how can so social, in our case, social scientists in Lebanon serve a, the larger scientific community by developing approaches to policy analysis that are more in tune with the reality on the ground? One of the problems is when you do engineering, basically it's the same here as it would be in France. When you build a bridge, you have to look at the nature of the ground, the structure, whether you can have to do an arch or you have to do suspension, whatever. There's not really that much difference. But when you talk about economics and politics, rule of law versus culture of impunity, there are huge differences. So, so what role can we play? And this is a big question mark. I'm not going to answer that question. But it's relevant for those of you who say, well, you know, there's not really much we can do. OK. How many of you have been to the Alps? The German, Austrian, Swiss, French, Italian Alps? Nobody. Have you, you've seen pictures. The, the mountains that you see are covered with trees which are not indigenous. Indigenous means those are trees that are really from there, originally from there. Why? Because during the Middle Ages, first of all, they cut down all the trees for mining purposes. Why would you need lots of trees when you're doing mining? When you, go into the, when you go into the mountain, if it's not made of pure rock, what do you need? You need supports. And in the Middle Ages, the supports were obviously made of wood. So you need supports. So you cut down the trees for supports. The good, the good timber, the good planks, the good beams are used for support. The rest of it is turned into charcoal. Charcoal is the stuff you use for your argile. But historically, in the Middle Ages, that was what you made heat with. When you want to when you want to refine metal, how, does, how do you do it? Does anybody know? You heat the rock, and what happens? The, 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 the temperature that the, rock, the metal melts at is lower than the temperature that the rock melts at. The rock will melt, too, if you spend enough time. See that in lava from volcanoes. But the rock stays solid. The metal melts faster. It drains off, and there you go. And what do you use? Charcoal, same stuff you use for your argile. When you cut down all the trees, then you do what? You dig up the roots, make them into charcoal too. After which you have a problem on the side of the mountain, which is called what when it rains? Erosion. The, the, when it rains, all the earth walks. This is why when you go to Greece, for example, or Lebanon as well, you see these wonderful rocky mountains. <coughs> Why are those mountains so rocky? Because all the earth has been washed away. Because of deforestation. This is not normal. So areas of regulation of wood and grazing, I'm going to go very quickly. Some of the other areas, foreign competition, regulating employers' rights. These laws are very, were very strictly enforced in Europe, but it was a long, long learning process. There was a transition. This is important for those of you who are in business, a transition from small family-run mines to big corporations. When you move from a family-run mine to a big corporation, you have a difference in perspective. Family-run businesses are always very, very caring of the thing that they're working with. Why? Why is a family-run business? It's usually their family <laughs> It's their family members. You screw it up, you ruin your family. When it's a big company, oh, I invested here, I lost some money, oh, I'll invest somewhere else next time. So when you have the introduction of, introduction of corporations in European mining, can you turn that back on, please? The introduction of 
oh, it's the electricity went off. OK. This is where you have a lot of the rejection or negation of rule of law. Thing. So the implementation in the Middle Ages, there were, I'm not going to go over this in, in detail, but you had mining for corporations about the 1500s, and you had also their, their own mining officials, the mining judges. The mines were independent entities. And we had WASTA. The German word for WASTA is vitamin B. Yes, it really is. How did you know that? Oh, I told you that. OK, yeah. So the corporations have WASTA with the central government, and that helps them circumvent, circumvent the local authorities. So if a corporation in the Alps doesn't want to obey the local authorities, they go to the central government using WASTA, and then they can get around it. This problem exists everywhere. Early forms of civil society, you have local academics, artists, uh, the beginning of pharmacy. The first farm, if you're interested in where pharmacy comes from, it comes, also comes from mining. Mining is even, more, is even cooler than railroads. You think railroads are cool? Look at mines. OK. So why did pharmacy start, modern day pharmacy start in the mining industry? That's not pharmacy. Diseases. Pharmacy is normally for diseases. What kind of health problems? Poisoning, contamination. Bravo. One of the things that they noticed is that when you heat the rock, these fumes come off of the rock, and then people seem to die quickly. And they didn't know why, right? So, <laughs> so one of the things that comes out is lead. It floats around in the air. It's really good for you. Uh, so it, the, the first actual sci modern scientific research into pharmacy, into the, the use of drugs, uh, synthetic drugs, was in this area. Uh, so have a closer look at this. Now, um, why do I use a German song? I, th I thought this was kind of cool. Uh, there's a song that marble, stone, and iron can break, but our love for the culture of impunity will never break. I would say that the culture of impunity is so strongly anchored in Lebanese society that something really, really radical has to happen. If you want to stand up to the culture of impunity, you have two options. You can wait for the society to change, or you can change individually. So it's up to you. You can, you, you can try to change society first, or you can change yourself. Here, here we have the breakdown. The traditional is agenda setting, decision making, implementation. And implementation is where it doesn't work. You can go over this on Blackboard. In the Middle East, phases one and two work really well. If you look at the laws, the, the upcoming laws, any law that is on the books, there's a nice discussion. The media, civil society, NGOs talk about it, blah, blah, blah. Then they pass it. The laws are usually pretty good because they're either based on the French or the American British model. It's the implementation where we have the problems. Very closely linked, of course, to, uh, to uh, ethics. Intentional inadequacy. What is this? What is intentional inadequacy? This is a theory that actually I developed with my wife. She did a, a, her dissertation on the broadcasting law in Lebanon. In the Lebanese laws, sometimes, if you look at them very, quick, very carefully, you see built in weaknesses. One classical, watch this, when you look at a law, if it's, if it's regulating anything, does it require a survey? Normally, when you do something, you have a survey first. And build on the survey, you can then implement the law. What's the problem with that? Who does the survey? The ministry. So the, the, the parliament passes the law. How can the ministry prevent the law from being implemented? Don't do the survey. Don't, <laughs> just don't let, in, in, in the mining industry, there's a, there's in, the, in, the, in the quarry industry, there's supposed to be a government survey of all the illegal quarries. The government has yet to carry out the survey. There's never been a survey of the broadcasting licenses in television and radio. Thus, the law on broadcasting cannot be carried out properly. Out of country voting 
If you are, you are, you know somebody, I'm sure you all know somebody who's over the age of 21 who lives outside of Lebanon. You all know someone. Can they vote? No. According to the law, can they vote? Yes. yes. Why can't they vote? They don't let them. The laws are not, are not being implemented. If you look at the 2007, often called Doha Act, there's also, why should we be surprised? The, pre the prerequisite, the precondition for carrying out out-of-country voting is a survey. So often there are things built in, very tricky things built in. Okay, very quickly now I'll go over these two aspects. Um, I'm not going to go over this in great detail, I think. In conclusion, social sciences need to develop new policy studies, a new policy studies approach adequate to the changes of implementation based research. So can you turn on the lights please? What was this all about? What does this, what, what does this have to do with ethics and leadership? What I just described was a situation where in the area of mining, in the area of media, in other areas, the system is very, very corrupt. And there's very little chance that the laws are going to be enforced. So what, is the, what, are the, what, are the, what do leaders have as options? If you're in a position of responsibility, what are your options? You, you can work to try to change the system, obviously, and you should. But if the system is so, if it's so ingrained, if it's so all-encompassing. What, what, what can you do? I mean, if you want to be an ethical leader, what is the most effective strategy? <laughs> Whistleblowing, then you'll get arrested or fired and your mother won't believe you anymore, in the case of Franco Bernabe. Okay, you can whist blow the whistle, that often leads to a lot of pain and suffering. What's the very, no, what, what, basically, what's the very first thing you can do? if you want to be ethical in an unethical uh, situation. Be ethical yourself. This is something that everybody can do. Be ethical yourself. Now, you would say, well, that's absurd. And it's really up to you whether you want to be ethical yourself in an unethical situation or not. We've seen a lot of theories about why that is to your advantage. The best example that I think, uh, or the most convincing one, is the thumbprints, if you saw the video, remember? Okay, good. So let's move on now to another concrete example. Can someone come up and change the, uh, the PowerPoint? We're now gonna move on to a, we're gonna save the theoretical one on religion for uh, Thursday, and now we're gonna move on to food production which is uh, Walker's Wood, yeah, food production. Okay. Can you do the same thing with the lights, just the back, the back lights and turn off the rest? These are all on Blackboard, by the way. But the back lights you should leave on, the back row. There you go, okay, perfect. So. What is, co by the way, a lot of you got this semi-wrong on the exam. What is the difference between philanthropy and CSR? In their core area of activity. If you said that some way, the answer was right, but this isn't, this isn't, very, very important. What does that mean, your core area of activity? Any institution, any organization does a lot of things, but one, normally one thing or a set of things is the main thing they do. What does that mean? What is the main thing that NDU does? Teaching. A lot of people will say, well, that's not good. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with the fact that NDU mainly does teaching? What else should we be doing, especially us professors? Research. Research. Right, so. 
And then there's a third area that we're all responsible for, which is administration. All of us have some sort of service responsibilities to the university. So the core area of our activities as employees of NDU is not administration and service. At the moment, the core area, and this is a discussion we're having right now, is not research. The core area is teaching. So if NDU were to do CSR, it would focus on teaching. And we'd find ways of making our educational services available to the community. We already have that, by the way. Does anybody know what? what? Yeah, the DCE, which stands for? Bravo, the vision of continuing education which opens up the university for the general population. So, that's corporate social responsibility, the core area of activity, not other stuff that an institution does, but the main thing that we're responsible for. Okay, business ethics and personal change, of course I'm using the, here, this is an IFC, an Initiatives of Change uh, slideshow, I'm using the assumption that in, an, in a corrupt world, especially in a country, this is about Jamaica, in a corrupt system, the only way to make any progress is to work primarily, or at least to start, with yourself. So I'm, this is a good friend of mine, Roddy Edwards. When you, when you get to be my age, you have friends who are in their 80s, right? This is a, one of those weird things that happens to you. You say, oh my God, I have friends in, my, in their 80s, you know? Uh, so Roddy Edwards was a pioneer in the field of corporate social responsibility before it was even called CSR. People have been doing this, by the way, for a long time, just didn't have a, uh, have a label yet. And in a holistic business ethics, and long before it became main mainstream internationally. What does mainstream mean? Main, it, li it literally means, if you look at a river, there's a current in a river. And then there are side currents. Sometimes when, it, when one river joins another river, there's currents you know, cross-cutting. The main stream, the main current in the river is where most of the water flows. The majority of the water, the bed is deeper. Normally when it's deeper, it's also slower. So used figuratively, the main stream is where most of the things are happening. So long before most businesses got into the CSR, uh, business, they, uh, Roddy Edwards was using this. He dis he's a descendant, he's white, living in Jamaica, that's always important in Jamaica. In Lebanon, it's not important whether you're white or black, that's not an issue, it's your, whether you're Christian or Muslim. But in Jamaica, it's whether you're of European or African descent. So, he's a descendant of a long line of British colonial planters in Jamaica, and he helped in the 1970s, in the 1970s there was no such thing as CSR as a term, uh, he helped create this concept in Jamaica, now it's going the other way, okay, good. He was determined to create local jobs for a large number of unemployed in the villages. He, he, just, he had two options, to do intensive agriculture and intensive mass production of uh, local cur uh, specialties in Jamaica, or to try to use his company to create jobs using ecological small farms in order to create you know, more jobs per, pro for, per unit and to produce high quality foods that are slow to make and less profitable. He chose the latter because it would serve a lot of people uh, and, and basically help his community. He felt responsible for this because as he says, his family had been guilty of theft for many generations. Why does Jamaica have a black population majority? What do you associate with Jamaica? What, what do you associate with Jamaica? Bob Marley, bravo. <laughs> so, before the blacks lived in Jamaica, who lived there? Indians. So what the British did basically, they came to Jamaica, introduced, introduced sugar production, Jamaican rum is famous, worked the Indians to death, and when all the Indians were dead, they needed new workers. So they brought in Africans, they didn't bring slaves, they brought in Africans and turned them into slaves. 
in Jamaica. They weren't born slaves. This is a point that people should be aware. So he felt responsible for undoing right here. OK, right, OK. Aware of the appalling history of slavery in the Caribbean, he says the best way to do this was to undo the damage through fair business practices. And today, that's a very successful model and is seen as one of the first CSR examples. Walker Woods Village, this is where he's from. You, know, it's a, you can see deforestation plays a role in Jamaica, too. And Jamaica Hills, halfway between Kingston and Montego Bay, close to Bob Marley's birthplace. OK, that will help you associate it a little bit with something you're interested in. He writes, this is his home. Obviously, this is not how the blacks lived. This is the way the whites live. Uh, and he created a cooperative on the eight, 800 acres near Walker's Wood, which is his fa family farm. It was his private property of his family. And similar to what we saw with the uh, thumbprint company, he turned the company over to the workers. What, is, what does that do when you turn the company over to workers? It, it does decentralization. decentralization. It increases what? Worker involvement. Worker involvement. It, it, it increases the, high, the level of Production. commitment, of retention. That was the word we were looking for. But it also creates a lot of headaches. Yeah, of course. You do this on, on purpose. When you turn your company over to the workers, you are asking for trouble. Because the workers obviously are not used to running a business the way a family is that has done this for a long time. So this is not something that is easy. How did you get started? If you have an idea you really believe in, seek advice, but don't bow to fear. So when you're, we saw this with the thumbprints. When you go into an unknown area, you are going to have problems. Be aware of that. More dilemmas and practical difficulties can help improve products and practice if faced squarely. Moral dilemmas are good. Now, we've talked about moral dilemmas. Why are they good? Why? Yeah, they're, they're forcing. Moral dilemmas make you a better person because they force you out of the flow of success, out of your comfort zone. They force you to grow. So he started very simple with local employees. <laughs> so this is, this is the head of production. It's just, it's just so you have a face. They, they, they decided to make local specialties, which are sauces and meat products, which were very popular, especially in the areas of the world where the British colonies were. What happened in, in, with, the, with the British Commonwealth was that they had an exchange of foods. What's the most popular fast food today in England? No. Curry from India. It has replaced fists and chips. So throughout the Commonwealth, they've had an exchange of foods and food tastes. So Jamaican food is now popular in England, is popular in parts of Africa because of the uh, British co uh, colonial legacy. Gradually, the production grew. It was mechanized. And the workers learned how to run their own company. Another lesson he learned, each country and each company is at a different stage of development facing differing degrees of national and global competition. Studying the best practice elsewhere is crucial, but each initiative needs, to be cur have, needs the courage to choose what is right for itself as it evolves. OK, what does this term mean, best practice? A very, very common term when we're talking about development. It's a phrase. It's a, it's a standing phrase. What does it mean? Best practice. It doesn't just mean best practice. When you're, when, you're, when you're introducing a project, 
the first thing you should do is you do research and look how other people are doing it. And today it's very simple. You just put it in best practice mining, best practice railroads, best practice food production. And you'll get examples of the people who are dealing with dilemmas, who are dealing with conflicts, and have found the best way of solving them. So this is one of the things you should be aware of. When you're dealing with moral dilemmas, there are plenty of best practice examples of how people have overcome them. So, this is just a little bit about the, the growth of the company. It's obviously inter more interesting when Roddy does it himself. Uh, 50, 50 employees is not a huge company. It's a, it's a medium sized enterprise, but this is where most of the jobs are. And for cooperatives, co uh, uh, worker run businesses, this is relatively the right size. Okay, they got praise from the World Bank. You can look at this um, on Blackboard. So they were successful. And they turned the company over to the employees. They were recognized internationally. With hundreds of independently involved providing raw materials as well as those processing food and marketing it. So this is, the, this is a, a real success story in Jamaica and is in the 1970s, long before this was done uh, internationally. They build a new factory. I gave you the example of my grandfather, remember? What, what happened to him? I'm, I'm sorry, my grandfather's dead. So. <laughs> Now my grandfather, when he sold the business, he, 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 got, he, got, he got leukemia uh, and he, he survived the leukemia and he promised God that if he survived, he would give all his money to the poor. He did. Which he did. <laughs> to our great chagrin, <laughs> when we looked at the will, there was hardly anything left, right? Okay. But they all came to the funeral, by the way, and they all sang his praise, right? All those people who had gotten the money. Okay, anyway, what was the point? The, po the point that I made. Okay, customers, large customers and suppliers are your most important ethical interface. What was the example I gave you with my grandfather's company? Right, so one of the large grocery corporations told my grandfather, this is decades ago, that they were going to buy over a period of three years huge quantities of the food he was producing. So he built a new factory. After three years, what did they say? They want you to reduce the price significantly, thinking that now he's going to go out of business unless he caves in, unless he goes along. That's a very, very harsh dilemma to deal with. Only companies that have a certain size can survive that. Smaller companies will either go bankrupt or give up, go along. Okay, so these kind of investments always can lead to problems. So, trust takes time to build. Setbacks are part of this history, eternity. Okay, what was happening here was that, I mean, Personally, I'm a, I'm a labor activist, but the, within the labor movement, there are people who are not, who are bad apples. But what, ha what happened was that some of the workers decided to try to take over the factory by playing what we call the race card. What is the race card? Oh, by the way, Sepp Blatter is now playing the race card. Did anybody hear about this? Sepp Blatter, the head of FIFA. How is, how is guys, how is Sepp Blatter coming to the defense of Qatar? Qatar. You guys don't watch? Football, come on. Se what, what's, what's going on with FIFA and Qatar? Okay, I, for, for the recording. Qatar is being accused of bribing FIFA. Okay, and yesterday Sepp Blatter, in, in order to defend himself, because if Qatar bribed FIFA, that means Qatar bribed, bribed Sepp Blatter, right? So Sepp Blatter, who's Swiss, 
is now accusing the people who are attacking Qatar of being racist. That works. You know, oh no, I'm not a racist. It, anyway, <laughs> this is what we got. It's funny, it actually is funny, because Sepp Blatter is, is anything but black, right? Uh, anyway, so half of, half of the people who are being accused are not even Arab, they're Swiss, right? Away with the white boy out of this community. What, what was going on here? Some people within the black run company, now that it was run by the, the locals and no longer by Roddy Edwards family, were trying to take over completely by using the accusation that we have to get rid of the whites. Can you think of a country in Africa where that's happening right now, where the leadership is guilty of horrible crimes against its population? No, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, where basically all the white population has been, has lost its rights using this race card. Anyway, so we can, we can go over this a little bit more detail. They survived this. The foods that they produce are very, very uh, competitive. Race card. Race. Race is skin color. Race. And when you play the race card, like in poker you play cards, the, when, you, when you throw down the race card, it means you accuse your opponents of being racist. So Sepp Blatter is accusing the people who are attacking him for being a criminal of being racist because the Qataris are so poor, you know, they're like third world uh, Arabs, you know, that are carrying heavy loads on their back like the Kurds in Ashrafia, you know. Anyway, so. So, he got a lot of recognition. And one of, what, what do companies that have a social con conscience usually do with their profits? Some of it, think, think of this, some of it goes, thumbprint, goes to the workers to improve their, I can't compete with you guys. Some of it goes to the workers to improve their wages and working conditions. Some of it is reinvested in the company, obviously, and some of it goes for community development, for schools, yeah. for health care, for cultural facilities. Is this paternalism? Yeah. Remember Swarovski? Yeah. When Swarovski got started back 120 years ago, the, the family that owned it did all of this. The family that owned it felt like a father treating their workers like children. And a good father takes care of his kids, right? Is this paternalism? Yes. Who's the father? No, it's, it's, uh, the Who's the owner? The, worker, the, the workers are the owners. This, this, this is the exact opposite of paternalism because the company is owned by the employees. You know, initially, Roddy Edwards took his family business and turned it over to the workers, so he was, in that sense, benevolent. But now that the workers are turning a profit, making, making, making money, and investing in community services and infrastructure, this is basically what is often called social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship is another, another category. What's that? Was that a question? No. Exam question. Exam question. Even, even Prince Charles showed up. Okay, that uh, shows how. Okay, he's asking for the exams. Okay, so good. Exam two. Good. I think. We'll, so, can you turn on the lights now and um, and bring up the bring up the uh, screen? Okay, good. Well, this is the end of the OER, first OER course at NDU. So you're all, um, I want to thank you all for being so patient and for most of you for being quiet while I was speaking. This was not an easy experience or an easy experiment to carry out, not only because we had a 
TV camera running all the time, but we also had 60 students in this class, which is also a new experience for most of you. So give yourself all a hand, and we're done.